I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Last time on the pod, I spoke about Persephone, and went into detail on how she went from being Kore, the young maiden daughter of the goddess Demeter, to becoming the queen of the underworld. I told you about how, with the permission of Persephone's father Zeus, Hades sprung out of the ground on his chariot one day, grabbed Persephone while she was picking flowers in a meadow, and took her down to the underworld to live with him. All of this happened while Demeter was out of the picture, and she was devastated to be unable to find Persephone afterwards. Eventually, Hecate tells Demeter that Persephone was kidnapped by Hades, and that Zeus ultimately knew about it the entire time. Demeter then left Olympus, and was eventually reunited, at least partially, with her daughter. Today, I want to talk about just what it was Demeter did after finding out Persephone was kidnapped. But first, though, a bit more about Demeter. She was the ancient Greek goddess of agriculture, the harvest, and basically any food that people grow to eat, but especially grain and other cereal crops. Demeter was one of the oldest six Olympian gods and goddesses, being a daughter of Rhea and Kronos. Just like most of her siblings, she was swallowed whole by her father. For all those reasons, in Greek art, Demeter is always depicted as a mature adult woman, often wearing a crown, but almost always with her hands full of sheaths of wheat, and she is never shown naked. We are clearly told in several sources, from the Archaic period to the Roman period, that Demeter had blonde hair. Demeter's name is variously considered to mean either Earth Mother or Grain Mother, either of which doesn't really change the interpretation of her. Demeter, though, was enormously important in ancient Greek religion. Greeks said prayers to Demeter, sang her hymns, and sacrificed pigs, bulls, cows, cakes, and fruit on her altars and in her temples. In ways that I'm going to touch upon throughout this episode, she had centers of worship throughout the Greek world. In Crete, Delos, Attica, the region of Athens, Argos, and even on the west coast of what is now Turkey, and in Greek colonies in Italy and Sicily. She was a very important figure in several special cults, and had numerous festivals dedicated to her. To give you an idea of what such a big deal these were, Here's a fun fact. The first real road in ancient Greece was built to connect Athens with a place called Ulysses, a very sacred place for Demeter. In the Greek myths, Demeter does not have a husband. Obviously, she is linked to Zeus through her daughter Persephone, but like a lot of Greek gods and goddesses, Demeter also took the occasional lover. According to Hesiod, Aeson was the son of Zeus and a nymph named Electra, one of the daughters of the titan Atlas. Demeter had sex with Ison in a field in Crete, and their child was Plutus, a god of wealth. Both Hesiod and Homer say that Zeus was angered by this and zapped Ison with a thunderbolt. But why was Zeus so angry about this? Well, two later sources expand upon the myth. Apollodorus's library quickly explains that Ison lusted after Demeter, and Zeus then zapped him before he could rape her. Diodorus of Sicily, writing slightly earlier than Apollodorus, gives a more detailed but significantly different take that also seems to allude to Hesiod's older version. He says that Ison was one of three siblings, the other being a boy named Dardanos and a girl named Harmonia. Zeus instructed Ison in the rites of a special cult on the island of Simothrace. Eventually, Ison's sister Harmonia got married, and the gods held a big feast for her. Demeter is said to have loved Ison and met him at this wedding. Later, Roman sources give the detail again about Ison dying. So it seems that the general story is Ison was favored by Zeus and loved by Demeter. They had sex at the wedding of Harmonia, and Zeus hit Ison with lightning in retribution. In Greek myth generally, while the male gods had many affairs with mortal women, the gods were very jealous when goddesses tried to do this too. Interestingly, Ovid's metamorphosis has Ison becoming a husband of Demeter, but it seems that that may have just been Ovid's interpretation. Now, back to the myths about Persephone's abduction. According to the Homeric hymn, after learning that Zeus was behind Hades' kidnapping of her daughter, Demeter angrily decided to avoid Olympus and travel through the mortal world in disguise as an old woman. Eventually, she came to the house of Calios, the ruler of Ulysses, a Greek city near Athens and she sat by the well where the local women were gathering water. The four daughters of Kelios were Kalidike, Kleisidike, Kalithoe, and, wait for it, Demo. Not sure why they couldn't come up with another K name. 
The four daughters came up to Demeter, and they asked her who she was and where she was from. Demeter, in disguise as the old woman, introduced herself as Dio and said she was from Crete. She told a story about how she was brought to mainland Greece against her will by pirates, but when they stopped at shore to have a meal, she escaped so that they would not sell her into slavery. Eventually, she wandered all the way to Ulysses. She says she wants to know if there is a house that she can go work for a couple in need of someone to nurse a child, look after a house, make the beds, and teach women. The daughter, Kalidike, says that there are many such households in the area, but that they will go tell their mother, Maidenera, to get the old woman to come to their home, as their mother had just given birth to a son in need of a nurse. So the four daughters did just that, and they got permission to bring the old woman to their mother. Later, the still-disguised Demeter followed the girls to where their mother sat in a great hall under a closed roof. When Demeter entered the room, she grew, so that her head touched the roof, signaling to Maitenera that this old woman was not just a normal old woman. Maitenera rised from her chair and allowed Demeter to take her place. But Demeter did not sit down, instead waiting for another seat to be brought and a fleece blanket to be thrown over it. Then she sat down with her veil in her hands and sat in sorrow, not greeting or speaking to anyone until Maitenera's servant Iambe was able to make her laugh by telling her dirty jokes. They offered her wine, but she said that she was not allowed to drink it, so instead they offered her a mix of water, grain meal, and mint to drink. Afterwards, Maitenera, apparently not getting the hint when Demeter walked into the Great Hall and made herself grow in size, said she thought that this Dio was not a lonely-born person, but instead was nobly-born, being only half right, only goddesses can change their heights, after all. So she asked Dio to nurse her son, Demophon, and the disguised Demeter replied she would be happy to. Furthermore, she told Maenera that witchcraft would not harm him because she knew a charm far stronger than any witchcraft, something that is going to make a whole lot of sense in a moment. So Demeter, disguised as Dio, nursed Demophon in the home of his mother and father, and Demophon grew like some immortal being, which means he grew supernaturally quickly and gaining strength. But he did this without being fed food or nourished by milk. Instead, during the day, Demeter would feed him ambrosia, the food of the gods, and cuddle him to her chest and blow on him. And during the night, she would not put Demophon in a crib. Instead, she would place the infant into the flames of the house's hearth or fireplace. It was the goal of Demeter to make Demophon immortal and ageless, like the gods themselves. But Demeter was interrupted, because one night, Maitenera saw Demeter place her son in the fire and let out a wail of horror and surprise. And Demeter heard her cry out, and she was not happy about it. She grabbed the boy out of the fire and actually threw him down onto the ground, before starting a speech. Witless are you mortals and dull to foresee your lot, whether of good or evil that comes upon you. For now in your heedlessness you have wrought fully past healing. Be witness the oath of the gods, the relentless water of Styx. I would have made your dear son deathless and unaging all his days and would have bestowed on him everlasting honor. But now he can in no way escape death and the fates. Yet shall unfailing honor always rest upon him because he lay upon my knees and slept in my arms. But as the years move round, and when he is in his prime, the sons of the Ulyssinians shall ever wage war and dread strife from one another continually. And with that, Dio declares her true identity, Demeter. And she calls herself the not particularly modest, greatest help and cause of joy to immortal gods and mortal men. She then calls on the people of Ulysses to build her a great temple, and says that she herself will teach them her most sacred rites and rituals she finally makes her disguise disappear. The wrinkles of the old lady Dio are replaced with the beauty of the goddess Demeter. A sweet smell fills the air, golden hair grows down from her head, and she even begins to glow, lighting up the great hall of the palace. Maitenera, meanwhile, sank to her knees in awe, forgetting her own son who is presumably still lying on the floor, by the way. Thankfully, one of his sisters seems to have been the only person not to have lost their complete wits at having Demeter appear in front of them, and she kindly picks up the baby. The sisters then take him and wash him. But him says the infant wasn't that happy with this, as they were not as skillful at holding him as the goddess was. Although, that's what the Homeric hymn says. The later account in Apollodorus's library says that the infant Demophon was burned up in the fire and died after Demeter was interrupted. Regardless, though, for the rest of the night, Maidenera and her daughters tried to appease Demeter, 
and finally told their father Kelios what had happened. Not really sure where he was the whole time. Let's say he was enjoying a nice scotch on the rocks in his garage or something. But anyway, Kelios returned and then gathered the people of Ulysses together to build a great temple for Demeter. Let's fast forward a moment. This is the point I talked about last episode, where Demeter sat in her temple at Ulysses, misses her daughter, and allows for a terrible famine to spread over the earth, one which almost destroyed the human race completely. First, Zeus sent Iris to bring his messages to Demeter, asking her to return. But when that didn't work, he sent Hermes to the underworld to bring back Persephone. Finally, once Demeter and Persephone are reunited, Zeus sends another messenger to Demeter. This time, he sent their mother, Rhea, probably because he wanted to use that mom clout to be absolutely sure Demeter would listen this time. Rhea shares the message that Demeter should rejoin the Olympians and promises her whatever right she should choose. Zeus promises that Persephone will spend a third of the year in the underworld because of the pomegranate seeds that she had eaten, and two-thirds on Olympus with Demeter. This time, Demeter agreed, and then made the famine end and a new spring to begin, so that fruit, leaves, and flowers began to grow all over the world. But before this, while on Earth, Demeter taught her special rites, described as awful mysteries which no one in any way may transgress, pry into, or utter, to several Greek kings, Kelios, Matanera's husband, Triptolemus, Diocles, Eumolopus, and Polyxenos. They in turn taught the mysteries to their followers, and then joined Zeus on Olympus too. Other myths elaborate on more jobs for the king Triptolemus. Apollodorus' library and other works by Callimachus, Diodorus of Sicily, Ovid, and others, although some of these seem to confuse him with Demophon, say that Demeter gave Triptolemus wheat and instructed him in how to grow it. Demeter then gave him a chariot pulled by flying serpents and instructed him to take the knowledge of growing wheat and spread it to other lands. One of those kings, Kelios, was the king in Ulysses when Demeter was there, and she ended up teaching her special rites, rituals, ways, and mysteries to the people in Ulysses. And for that reason, those awful mysteries Demeter taught were known as the Eleusinian Mysteries. But what exactly were these Eleusinian Mysteries? In essence, Demeter established one of her real-world cults. It was a special cult based in the city of Ulysses, specifically a particular building called the Telastrion, which is Greek for Initiation Hall. This was a very special site in ancient Greece. Politically, it was a neutral sanctuary, and remained open to all Greeks regardless of their city-state of birth, even in times of war. There were several locations like this in ancient Greece, and most of them, like the Telestrion in Ulysses, were temples dedicated to various Olympian gods. For example, the temples of Apollo at Delphi, where the oracle was, and his other major temple on Delos, were sites just like this, open to everyone. Some other temples like this were the Temple of Poseidon in Corinth, and apparently even the Parthenon in Athens. So, what exactly happened in the Telestrion in Ulysses? Well, we don't really know for sure. The cult was called a mystery cult, for good reason. There were some other cults like this too in ancient Greece. But basically, they were supposed to be a secret. The first rule of Fight Club, don't talk about Fight Club. The first rule of the Eleusinian Mysteries, don't talk about them. Zip it. But of course, sure enough, some people did not keep their mouth shut, and so we have at least some idea of what went on in the Eleusinian Mysteries and some of the other mystery cults too. The cult was based around the myths that I've recounted in this episode and the last episode. The myth of Persephone's abduction and how she became Queen of the Dead, and the stories of Demeter's wanderings and how she established a temple at Ulysses, and also the eventual reunion between mother and daughter. The mystery cult present at Ulysses was very ancient. Archaeological excavations show that the site was used in the period of Mycenaean Greece. An important part of the Eleusinian mysteries seems to celebrate the birth of a divine child. Inscriptions at the site reference this. The phrase, Mightni Potnia bore a great son, was apparently one of the many chanted by initiates of the mysteries. Potnia is an old Greek word. I've mentioned before that it means lady or mistress and was used to describe various goddesses, such as Athena, but especially Demeter and Persephone, in particular by the Mycenaean Greeks. But who was the divine child? Unfortunately, that is not clear. It could have referred to Persephone, but it could also have referred to Demophon or Triptolemus, for example, who was taught Demeter's mysteries 
in the Homeric hymn. It could even refer to a potential mystery boy that some myth traditions hint was the son of Persephone and Hades. So how did the real-world Eleusinian mystery cult work? There were several ranks of people involved in the mysteries. First, there were the priests and priestesses who knew the mysteries and led the participants through the rituals. These included a male and female high priest and priestess, male torchbearers, and other priestesses who were married and served either Demeter or Persephone, or women who were generally secluded from men. Then, there were several levels of initiates, and these were those participating in the mysteries for the first time. The requirements for this were not that strict. Potential participants were those who had never committed murder and were not barbarians, meaning they were not foreigners who were unable to speak Greek. Women and slaves could also become initiates. Above these new participants were the returning participants, and above them were those who reached ipoteia, or contemplation. These were the people who had learned the deepest levels of the Eleusinian mysteries. You can think of these ones as having attained enlightenment. The Eleusinian mysteries appear to be organized into different levels, the lesser mysteries and the greater mysteries, which were celebrated at different times, one in the spring and one at the end of the summer. We do not have a lot of details on what this mysterious knowledge would have been. Publicly, there were a number of festivities, festivals, dances, and a bull sacrifice. The secret stuff happened within the Telestrion. Scholars generally believe that there was a dramatic reenactment of the myth, as well as speeches and hymns, and sacred objects were shown off. The punishment of giving away details was death, and some famous ancient Greeks were even tried in Athenian court because of this. People also broke a fast with a drink called kaikion. This is a general term for a beverage drunk in ancient Greece, typically made from water, barley, and something else. In the Demeter myth, when the goddess declined a drink of wine, she received a kaikion instead, which is probably why people participating in the Eleusinian mysteries drank one. There are other kaikion in other myths too. In the Odyssey, the witch Circe makes one with honey in it. In the Iliad, there is mention of a kaikion made from wine, barley, and grated goat's cheese. Sounds pretty unpleasant. But back to the Eleusinian mysteries. It's possible that the kaikion here was special. There are, admittedly controversial, scholarly theories that the barley used to make the beverage could have contained a parasitic fungus that, if drunk, would have given the kaikion psychedelic properties. Hearing all of this and knowing how secret the mysteries were, you're probably wondering, why all the fuss? What did the people get out of it? Well, like in so many other religions, the initiates of the Eleusinian mysteries believed that they were going to get some kind of special treatment after they died. As the mysteries developed over time, this point was built up too, and by the end of ancient Greek civilization, immortality of some kind was the supposed final destination. The physical layout of the Telestrion in Ulysses is supposed to be very similar to another large temple located in Lycosura, in Arcadia in southern Greece. Sure enough, this temple is also closely linked with Demeter, through another mystery cult. As I mentioned in the Poseidon episode, Demeter was once raped by Poseidon. Later Greek and Roman writers fit this incident into the Persephone abduction story by saying it occurred while Demeter was busy looking for her daughter Persephone. What happened was that Poseidon lusted after Demeter and she tried to hide from him in Arcadia in the form of a horse, but he turned into a stallion and mounted her. Afterwards, she gave birth to two children, a young boy horse named Arion and a female, a daughter given the name Despoina, meaning the mistress coming from that word again, potnia. The late Greek writer Pausanias says that after she gave birth to Arion and Dyspoinia, Demeter became very angry. Fairly, of course, since Poseidon had raped her in this version. And then she went into a cave to purify herself, again causing a great famine. Similar to Ulysses, the cult temple in Arcadia seems to have been centered around Demeter and this other daughter, Dyspoinia. It's not clear who this Dyspoinia is. The name Dyspoinia is a stand-in. Her name was a secret of that particular mystery cult. Instead, she is referred to as the mistress. Kind of like how Persephone was simply known as Kore, the maiden, in some circumstances. Not much is known about this mystery cult in Arcadia. It seems to be very ancient and also limited to the region of Arcadia. Before leaving off today, I want to go back a moment to Demophon. As I mentioned, Demeter attempted to make this human baby an immortal, or at least super strong by feeding him ambrosia instead of milk, and baking him in a fireplace every night instead of placing him in a crib. 
Interestingly, this is the second time we've witnessed a goddess subjecting a baby to rather bizarre treatment in order to make him immortal. The first time was back in the Athena episode, when I talked about how after Hephaestus ejaculated on Athena's leg in an attempted rape, a child was born when the semen came in contact with the ground. Athena decided to raise this child in secret, and like Demeter, tried to make him into an immortal. Only, instead of baking him, Athena put him in a box with snakes. It didn't end up working either, after some princesses opened the box. What's more though is, there was another, probably more well-known example, of a divine female doing this too. Thetis, a Nereid, a type of sea nymph, tried to make her own half-human child immortal, unlike the adopted foster children of Demeter and Athena. Thetis' son was Achilles, a major Greek hero and the star of Homer's Iliad. Thetis was very much part of the larger Olympian family. She was raised and loved by Hera, and courted by both Zeus and Poseidon. Eventually, though, Thetis had Achilles with a human king, and tried to make him invulnerable by taking the baby to the underworld, lifting him by the foot, and dipping him in the river Styx in the underworld. Where the water touched his body, Achilles became invulnerable, except of course for his foot, which was not put into the river. Apparently Thetis had just come from getting a manicure and didn't want to get her hand wet. But, even so, Thetis was the most successful. Demeter and Athena were both foiled in their attempts to empower human babies by other human beings. Turns out, it seems, there were multiple ways in Greek myth to make an immortal. Maybe Demeter should have taken Demophon to the underworld and dipped him in the river. She may have had better luck. Last episode, I told how Hades, the ruler of the underworld, schemed with Zeus to marry Persephone, and then kidnapped her and took her to the underworld. I talked about what went on there, and how she was eventually reunited with her mother. This episode, I talked about Demeter, talked about her cults, her importance, and the myths that cover the time she was on Earth while Persephone was down in the world below. But I haven't yet talked about Hades, and the land of the dead that Persephone would have found when she got dragged down there. Next episode, I'll talk about the underworld, what it was like, who lived there, and tell you about its king, Hades, and its queen, Persephone. And that's all for today. If you're enjoying these episodes, please get the word out and tell a friend. Thank you for listening.